Hello and welcome to this Nature Research custom media webcast titled Preclinical AAV Production and Optimization, Not as Easy as It Looks. My name is Sarah Hiddleston and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by Genscript. Adeno-associated virus is the most popular vector of choice for gene therapy because of its low immunogenicity and ability to infect numerous cells and tissue types. However, with hundreds of gene therapy trials ongoing, manufacturing large quantities of viral vectors is becoming an increasing challenge. We'll begin by hearing from Dr. Stephen Hughes, Director of New Platform Development at Genscript, who will discuss the current challenges and trends in preclinical AAV production and optimization, and discuss some recent advances in viral vector production. We'll then move on to a question and answer session with you, the audience. You can ask a question at any point you wish throughout the webcast. To do so, please type your question in where it says type your questions here, and then press submit, and we will answer them at the end of the session today. And now, over to Stephen. Thank you for that introduction. My name is Stephen Hughes. I'm the director of New Platform Development at Genscript. Today, we'll be talking about preclinical AAV production and optimization, and it's not easy as it looks. What is gene and cell therapy? Uh, gene therapy is the introduction and removal or change of content of a person's genetic code with the goal of treating or curing disease. Cell therapy is the transfer of intact live cells into the patient to help lessen or cure a disease. The cells may originate from the patient, which would be an autologous therapy, cell therapy, or it might be uh, from a donor cell line, which would be an allogenic therapy. What are the differences between gene and cell therapy? Gene therapy involves the transfer of genetic material, usually in a carrier or vector, and the uptake of the gene into the appropriate cells of the body. Cell therapy involves the transfer of cells with the relevant function into the patient. Some protocols utilize both gene therapy and cell therapy together. In this case, stem cells are isolated from the patient. They're genetically modified in tissue culture to express the new gene. They're expanded, they're differentiated sometimes, and then returned to the patient in large enough numbers for a dose. Gene therapy is a, is a medical field which focuses on the genetic modification of cells to produce a therapeutic effect or, or the treatment of a disease by repairing or reconstructing the defective genetic material. Uh, there is a, a large amount of screening effort uh, in a targeting and identification phase. There's a lead, optimi lead optimization phase and then a preclinical scale up for uh, mouse studies and going into phase one clinical trials. In that target identification, oftentimes high throughput screens that go through tens or hundreds of thousands of different variant uh, plasmids and genes are, are, are done uh, to identify those candidates that would go into the lead optimization phase. At the lead optimization phase, this might involve the uh, vector uh, change out, the animal and cell engineering that might be involved, and then those cells, uh, which are now down in the tens or hundreds, are then moved to preclinical, uh, the scale of which increases at each level. So where we're at the microgram level at the targeting phase, we might be at the MIG level at the lead optimization phase in high number. And then we, when we get to the preclinical stage, they, there might be 10 or so samples, but these samples are at uh, multiple MIG or gram scale. And all of this requires a great deal of skill and scale up and this is something that the contract arena, particularly Genscript, is expanding uh, to meet these needs. On the cell therapy, a thera which is a type of therapy where viable cells are injected or grafted or implanted into the patient in order to effectuate a medical effect, uh, these cells are often uh, of several different types. We have CAR T, uh, which is chimeric antigen receptors. Uh, you can see some of these early gene therapies and cell therapies involve CAR-Ts where uh, many uh, different engagers, that is the antibody-like outside, is uh, screened for best binding to these target uh, cancer cells uh, to, effecti to effectively take out the uh, leukemia cells. 
So that target identification uh, can require many uh, optimizations of these open reading frames. Uh, then those open reading frames are tested at the lead optimization phase, uh, possibly in cell culture first to see if they bind the target well and eliminate those cells, and then moved into an in vivo animal model where those uh, cell lines can be, these test cell lines can be shifted into the animal and tested. Uh, and then there's a scale up phase. So the production of these require uh, viral vectors and those viral vectors have to be uh, engineered and scaled up uh, to the preclinical stage, which could be in the MIG uh, quantity. Uh, the several of the uh, gene and cell therapies that are on the market to date are Luxterna and Kimria, which came out in twenty end of 2017, and Brianzi, which came out recently. Uh, Luxterna is a spark therapeutic uh, product that introduces the uh, RP65 uh, uh, blind, uh, uh, gene uh, to recover blindness in patients. The patient population is about 1,000 to 2,000 patients a year. And uh, Roche owns that uh, company, Spark, now. And what we're what we're seeing is these virus that are used to introduce that gene into the retina uh, require uh, large numbers of doses. Now, if we are to move to other diseases which require more doses, you can see how this is going to need to be scaled up. Uh, Kimria is a CD19 car from Novartis. Uh, that is using autologous cells from the patient. It's a, it's a very important uh, product, and it uh, streamlined the process at FDA for approval of gene therapies. So you're going to see more and more of these therapies. And Brianzi uh, just came on uh, the scene. It recently was approved, and it also is highlighting the need for skilled labor and a, a lot of uh, plasmids to be produced to come up with these, with these therapies. If we take a close look at uh, the two types of therapies we just mentioned, the gene and cell therapy overview here, you can see in an ex vivo uh, therapy like uh, Kimria, uh, cells are aphoresed from the patient. It's a complicated uh, process. The cells are aphoresed from the patient in the hospital. The T cells are isolated. Uh, those T cells are then transduced with a virus carrying the CAR T gene. And that CD19 CAR is then expressed on those T cells. Those T cells go through an expansion phase and then are put into an IV bag, which is uh, a courier, takes that uh, product back to the hospital and it's infused in the patient uh, uh, to treat uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia. And when using an AAV virus on an in vivo route, much like uh, Luxterna, uh, the virus is produced by a transfection process where multiple plasmids carrying the helper functions for the AAV helper, the AD5 helper, and the payload are placed into a production cell line like a HEC-293 cell. And then those cells are directly injected in the patient's eye behind the retina, retinal epithelium. And those virus then uh, put the RPE65 gene and express that in the retinal ep epithelium, restoring uh, the, the, the blindness, re restoring sight. What's an AAV? AAV stands for adeno-associated viral vectors, and they are also known as AAVs. They are typically used to deliver small payloads, somewhere between uh, one and two kilobase, uh, and they're effective at getting genes into the target uh, tissue. They're known to be safe and they're very efficient at delivering the uh, payload, which is why they're, they're used and in, in successful in in vivo gene therapy. And why do we use them? They're, they're used because they're replication defective, so they, they do not replicate. They're non-integrative into the genome, so they can express large amounts of, of virus. And they have low immunogenicity in humans. Some of the limitations with AAV are the off-target effects where it's uh, hard to control sometimes where uh, the gene does insert itself into the genome and they're taking great lengths to reduce the uh, chances of that uh, introduction of the gene. The manufacturing process is also very cumbersome and it requires a great deal of timing and skill with not only cell culture but with uh, creating the best uh, viral vector uh, plasmids to uh, produce virus. And it's a very complicated process to make virus. And sometimes its uh, uh, batches have some variability. There's common, there's several common delivery systems. You have uh, several types of viral vectors that are being used. Uh, they've been using lentiviral vectors for CAR T work uh, like Kimria, and they have been using adenovi adenovirus for 
uh, dental viral vectors at Spark uh, for introducing uh, uh, RPE65. And then other groups are using adenovirus itself, uh, which is of the AD5 family. The, there are other uh, lipidic particles that are being used, uh, the LNPs, uh, as well as liposomes and other gold and inorganic particles for delivering DNA to cells. And then there are phys physical delivery mechanisms like using electroporation to deliver DNA directly or uh, using microinjection. Breaking down the AAV manufacturing process is a very elegant system. And in parallel is the production of the HEC-293 cells, which are done in a cell culture uh, procedure, which involves various stages of scale up, which can take on the order of a week to scale up enough cells to do a batch. Those cells are then transfected with polyethylene imine or pi, which is a branched molecule. It has to be a certain type of branching. It can't be too branched or, and it can't be underbranched. And that is mixed and complexed with the triple uh, plasmid uh, set. And that takes a very set amount of time. That, that timing is very important as well as the health of the cells that are being transfected. Typically, uh, uh, various machines for adherent HEC-290 cell lines are used, which uh, involve a machine from Paul called the Incellus machine, Icellus machine, sorry. And that machine has a square foot area of adherent cells that uh, approaches 500 square feet, which is about the size of a small apartment. So it's a, it's a large uh, amount of surface area that's required for this transfection. And that uh, from this process, you get about 100 doses using that process. There are several ways to do this using plates as well. We tend to want to move toward a non-adherent cell line, which allows us to do many more doses. Uh, so I will talk more about that in upcoming slides. But as far as the process here, it's, it's important to note that the transfection is complicated and it has a very distinct timing. We're trying to put this in a uh, robotic setting so that these timings can be accurately and implemented without a lot of variability. There's, a, we analyze the lysis stage and in the cell harvesting, we're looking for the maximum amount of virus to be produced. And we'd like most of that uh, virus to be in a form that we could easily uh, use chromatography to pull that virus away from the debris and the rest of the lysate. Uh, there's a polishing step where we remove debris and then we do aseptic fill into the production and the uh, dose uh, packaging. And then uh, we are using uh, several analytical methods that are prescribed in the guidances from FDA to make sure that we understand what is in the dose. Uh, any residual uh, material is being analyzed as well as what type of DNA and if the capsids are formed. The HEC-293 cell uh, growth and production performance is looked at uh, at, Chi at, um, at uh, GenScript with uh, great uh, effort. And what we see is the benefits of the HEC-293 is the ease of growth and serum-free uh, suspension culture. It's amenability to transfection, and it, it's also of human origin. And to enhance this HEC-293 production efficiency, efforts are put into rational engineering strategies targeting bottlenecks and prolif pro proliferation, carbon metabolism, and protein processing and maturation. And we also are looking, and one of our strengths is the assembly and uh, uh, production of plasmids that go that are engineered uh, for the production of these viruses. And we use various functional genomic tools to optimize these open reading frames. One of the things that is required is the ability to do high throughput screens. So if we have to look at many plasmid variants to find the optimal virus or the optimal AAV that increases its targeting ability or what they call tropism, uh, using the present pseudotypes, it's important to screen through these in high numbers. And that cell culture has to meet that demand. So we are looking at uh, putting robotics not only behind the plasmid, but behind the culturing events. And that requires a lot of uh, various types of genomic analysis to verify uh, that there is DNA in the capsid, the capsids are well formed, and as well, those analyses also have to be done in high throughput right alongside the production. Various uh, groups, including the MEGR group, is looking at ways of optimizing different types, different pseudotypes of AAV. In their study with AAV8 particles, 
they find that the in the cell life states and the culture media, the change over time is is dependent. It's also depend the the formation of viruses dependent not only on time but on the type of recombinant uh, vectors that are being used. And they elegantly showed that with different payloads, they get different uh, optimal times when the the AAV is found in the cell media. And when the AAV is uh, in the cell media, it's easier to isolate. And just, just to note that in these uh, three types of uh, recombinant uh, plasmids that they're using, one for factor eight, one for factor nine, and one also for cathepsin, they can show that at different timings, they get different levels of virus just based on the change in the payload. The, clue, the, the conclusion is that time is an important factor in improving AAV8 yield and can shift the distribution of particles more greatly toward the culture media. It's important to consider for large scale production where the medium may be harvested alone, making way for more efficient, less labor intensive and time consuming production. The implications here very strongly implicate that the recombinant vector dependent processing mechanisms are, are taken into consideration and GenScript is positioning itself to look at both of these measures. If we look at the SULAB data, a very interesting study was done and how to improve target delivery. How do we facilitate also modular attachment of peptides to AAV? So these two points are very, uh, are very interesting. Uh, so what they did is they added a leucine zipper to the cap of the AAV. And what that does is after enterokinase digestion, allows that to bind a like zipper on either a, another molecule that might be an enzyme or an antibody that contains that same type of leucine zipper, creating what they call a Velcro AAV. That is that these molecules can enhance the production of virus. The conclusions, what they, what they concluded, it demonstrated that the modified capsid's ability to bind peptides with complementary adapters enhance the viral production. The Velcro AAV forms structurally intact capsids and retain transdu transduction ability with variable levels of depending on the insertion and cell type. The, these, this protein display platform may facilitate the incorporation of biological moieties such as antibodies and enzymes on the AAV surface. And GenScript is setting this type of platform up. The implications are that the expanding possibilities for vector enhancement and engineering combinatorial targeting and delivery, promoting the zipper attached cargo release at the target site, and strengthening these coiled coiled linkers for target delivery can be very helpful to virus uh, targeting and production. What are the challenges of the current method? That's a very important uh, uh, topic. So what we're moving toward is not only the amount of virus that's being produced, but the way it's being produced. The, tr the, the present process, this three plasmid pie transfection of the AAV helper, the ad five helper with the payload is very complicated. It, are there ways that we can streamline that? And this all requires DNA synthesis. We see how important the recombinant vectors are to this process and that may be the key to producing very large doses. Now, when we say large doses, uh, one example could be Alzheimer's disease. So the patient population for Luxterna is rather small. There's a couple thousand people with that RPE65 blindness. But if you look at the population with Alzheimer's disease, that could be uh, somewhere between 50 and 80,000 doses. So it's a much higher amount. The And let's take it for an example, the number of virus needed by Luxterna. There's 150 billion virus in each dose of Luxterna. That's about 20 animal study. So it gives you an idea of the scale at which we would have to make doses for Alzheimer's disease if we used AAV as the host. That would be uh, a great, uh, 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 you'd have to increase the production a hundredfold. Now our production process, let's say we use a hundred square foot, which, which interestingly is about the size of a Manhattan apartment. Uh, it would take several of these bioreactors bio on a floor to produce the doses for just Luxterna. If you had to produce Alzheimer's uh, doses, it would be uh, um, many fold bigger, probably a 500,000 square foot building versus a 50,000 square foot building. 
And then the per gene therapy candidate animal testing goes up dramatically as well. So you would be making hundreds of megs of plasmid for AAV per week. And this is very costly. And that re requires a lot of animals. So GenScript is positioning ourselves with all sorts of automation. One of my goals is to have these robots in place by midsummer for plasmid production and scale up. Transfection and elimination of three plasmid AAV system. So there, if we look at the traditional system, there's a, there's a vector plasmid that has the payload, there's a packaging plasmid that has the cap rep gene, and then there's the helper plasmid that has the functions from ad five. Those three are co-transfected into HEC-293 cells to produce virus. These plasmids are large. So if you, if you have to produce these plasmids, it takes a lot of skill in doing the uh, plasmid preps. And if you have to do them in great number, you can see that that requires very, uh, um, I wouldn't say tricky robots, but it requires great skill in setting up the robots to do that production. Sometimes the long, the long growth phase is optimal. So you have to strategically make your DNA so that you're, you're providing your client's DNA on a regular interval, interval for these tests. And as well, you have to marry that plasmid production with a transfection process that can handle the same number of, of uh, viral production samples as you have plasmids. So that has to be coordinated. And then if you get into the arena where you take the payload plasmid, and let's say you're trying to reduce the number of plasmids and you just put in positive single strand DNA, uh, we have a GMP facility that will be making double strand DNA, linear and single strand linear DNA by the end of next year in a GMP format. Where are the bottlenecks in the DNA manufacturing? Uh, if you're talking about doing this in-house, it can be very costly. It takes a lot of people to do this process if there's no robot. Our ro robots require very few people to operate them and yet make quite a few samples on the order of a thousand per day when we're operational. Uh, to do that in-house would require 10 or more people, each one spending 40 man hours per every 10 meg of DNA. Uh, and what you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to pull people off of their R&D projects just to make plasmid. And that's where GenScript, a contractor, can come in very helpful. The, the, other, the other operation that we're striving toward is doing the plasmid production in a continuous fashion, in a continuous fashion and, and provide DNA that is of the right concentration to use right away, possibly packaged in the format you need for AAV production with 100% sequ sequence accuracy. And at the end of the day, you don't wanna become a DNA production expert. You wanna make, uh, you wanna make good therapies. What, what does that, that uh, production facility look like? Well, if you are to make a thousand maxi preps a day, it can be daunting. Uh, but what we've implemented is manufacturing robots rather than laboratory robots. Manufacturing robots, you know, typically the kind of robot you would see in assembly lines making anything from cars to cell phones are very robust. The, uh, the life uh, time for a particular manufacturing robot is on the order of 50,000 hours. That's about five years of continuous operation. And what we're doing at GenScript is setting up robots that will do plasmid in that kind of production scenario, not only for plasmid, but we'll have other robots that are producing double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA is important for cell culture. Uh, if you are trying to engineer a cell line with, like a HEC-293 cell line with the helper genes from AD5, that piece of DNA could be as long as 200, kilo, 200 kilobase to get those genes into the HEC-293 cell. So you wanna have a robot that's capable of making those very long double-strand pieces of DNA. And then uh, the single-strand payload is very important. Uh, for making positive single-strand DNA, and we're also automating those cell lines. So the uh, double-strand DNA more so for the engineering of cells, the single-strand DNA more for the payload for AAV. And for CAR-T, we're also looking at double-strand DNA for episomal uh, uh, delivery of CAR-T, which is much safer than the plasmid route. All that GMP DNA will be online at the end of next year. And we traditionally are very good at uh, verified SG RNA guides. So one of the uses for single strand DNA could be to use that with CRISPR-Cas9 to engineer the cell lines. So we have that GMP SG RNA also coming online at the end of next year in robotic. It's present, we, we have it now manually, but we'll have it in a robotic scenario. 
This is the diagram of the production facility for a thousand maxi preps a day. And what you can see in this robotic line is the use of these five axis arms on tracks. And roughly what's happening here is uh, this is the loader. This is where your sample comes in from your, your company. We store it in the freezer. We then prep it into a glycerol stock, which we load into an inoculation chamber, which inoculates all the bottles you see in all these incubators. These are taken out at intervals, they're, they're centrifuge, and then we use this to produce the, uh, the plasmic prep in this production line. So we have lysis, chromatography, extraction, and then those samples go into QC area, which is here, and then we send the resulting DNA to you, uh, and that can be in a very quick turnaround. GenScript is a one-stop solution for your AAV needs. We are striving to get you everything you need right up to your preclinical plasmid sample and viral sample. Uh, that involves a couple of things. It involves being very good at making ITRs, whether those are flip-flop ITRs on your payload or whether these are specialized single ITRs. We also are interested in uh, assembling your viral vector packaging plasmids and then making your resulting AAV and lentivirus from that. So we can do the screening level, which we talked about through the uh, uh, preclinical testing and into your phase one trial. And the engineering of cell lines is one of our specialties, including our, our groups. Uh, so it's, a, it's teamwork. It's using our CRISPR uh, groups to help our cell engineering and give you the optimal production cells. Our portfolio, if you look at our website, has traditionally included very strong efforts in molecular biology, whether it's plasmid or now with the linear DNA options. Uh, we couple our assembly line directly to our plasmid production. Our CRISPR services are available, and we can do your CRISPR if you would like. Uh, that's going to be very helpful in the upcoming days when we have to onboard CRISPR for the uh, therapy itself or use the CRISPR in your production scenario. Uh, our antibody group has been around a while we're making custom antibodies, but now we're, we're aiming our custom antibody work toward ma specifically making engagers for both your, your TCRT, your T-cell receptor therapies, and your CAR-Ts, your, your chimeric antigen receptor therapies. And with the advent of the peptides being important for AAV production, we're gearing our peptide group toward making these leucine type pep, leucine zipper type peptides to enhance our targeting as well as our production efficiency. And then uh, our protein and antibody group is also being uh, arranged so that we can bring in uh, targeting expertise if we need to bring that in for targeting AAB. And then finally, our, our viral vector packaging group is working right now, and we're hoping to automate that in the near future. Some of the skill sets that are important for AAV production, uh, which are being sought right now, is our ability to sequence through the ITR. So it's one thing to make the ITR and make these very uh, uh, distinct ITRs for making the uh, targeting much better and making the uh, replication much better. Uh, but it's the ability of using our, our Gen ITR V1 strain uh, to do ITR Sanger sequencing so that we can make sure that those sequences are verified. And this is important for the QC package that the FDA is going to receive and your CMC section. Our CRISPR groups are, have two uh, DNA available to them. They have the covalently closed end, the, the gene wand. And the important thing about gene wand is it's very long. The DNA is on the order, it can be anywhere from 2 to 10 kilobase, which is important for engineering uh, HEC-293 cell lines. And then our gene exact single strand DNA is uh, up to five, 500 nucleotide, which is about the size of the full ITR to ITR payload for AAV. And if you enhance uh, your transfection and you're able to use single strand DNA like we're trying, it skews the capsids for those having only the positive strand message, which makes the dose much more effective and you get less negative strand, which you can't use in your capsid. And it also reduces the amount of empty caps. Our molecular biology ser services are reliable, and we can supply these uh, DNA species that you need, and the, the, we can do things that are very simple, and th these assemblies we can do in the hundreds per day. Uh, we can turn those into plasmids quickly. Uh, we can engineer your antibody at the gene level, and we can turn that around in seven business days. 
The ITR synthesis and sequence verification expertise is unique to us, and we have 100% sequence flexibility uh, uh, fidelity with our NGS and our for QC of these AAV payloads. The plasmid preparation scale-up options are, are, are you know, company-wide or large, but with the, with the advent of that robot coming in in the summer, uh, we should be able to be up to a thousand a day. So you can you can essentially turn your plasmid pro, uh, production to us, and then we can keep the master cell bank, and you can call us, and we can produce that at whatever scale you need. And we can provide the QC options, so we can tell you we can do this at uh, various different quality levels, uh, and r remove endotoxin from that process, and look for supercoiled plasmid. Uh, the GenScript molecular biology services are used for vector engineering antibody car optimization, vaccine development, and gene therapy development. The levels of plasmid uh, quality range from our research grade uh, high throughput plasmids, which could be at the microgram level, and uh, th that could be done uh, for uh, getting your assemblies produced. Uh, in your early drug phase, we can reduce the endotoxin uh, to an endotoxin free level with high supercoiled, and then when you move into the preclinical area, we can add all the other uh, QC test methods that are, are required by FDA, accuracy, quantity, quality. With the stringent QC, uh, we can add on whatever it is for contaminant removal. The viral vector packaging group can optimize your viral vector production for maximal yield. Intact functional viral vectors ensure high transduction efficiency, and we can also look at your titer and QC methods and have that ready for your phase one study. Our AAV group is the cell power assay cell line development group, and our lentiviral side is also present. These can be used for knockout screens, cell engineering, and therapeutic gene delivery. And I'd like to end by saying our, our engineered cell line groups are ready for your uh, scale up and our viral vector packaging groups are also of high quality and of superior performance in this uh, race to get good therapies to market. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Steve, it's now time for the question and answer session. To ask a question, please type it in where it says type your questions here and then press submit. So to get us started then today, Steve, can I ask you what types of single sequence DNA payloads would be an improvement over plasmid and what? Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, um, uh, there is a, a way to produce single-strand DNA that would allow uh, the optimization of the rep gene binding uh, location and could foster not only replication but would increase the amount of positive strand uh, payload that is in the capsid. And, it, and while getting mostly positive strand and reducing the uh, and eliminating getting negative strand DNA possibly, uh, that would increase the effective dose. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question asks what the ratio is of full to partially full to empty capsids. Right, right. Uh, you know, so this is the key. You know, what we're trying to do at GenScript is we're trying to not only provide the ability to go in and give uh, the variance. Uh, so the if you want to optimize targeting or optimize the amount of virus you're making, you need to do uh, many variants. And uh, you need to look at the ratio, and that is something that you have to combine. You have to combine the screening with the analytics. OK. Um, our next question asks about the AAV concentration that can be achieved without AAV uh, aggregation. What's your thoughts on that? Right, right. So some of the papers that we highlighted are looking at trying to skew the production of virus uh, into the medium. And uh, the isolation from the medium is a lot easier than from the cellular debris. And the timing is important, too. 
so we would, uh, you know, we would like to work with groups, uh, particularly where they're screening. But we can couple our large capacity for making plasmids with the way to optimize the virus uh, produced from the uh, cell uh, cell culture uh, purification. Okay, thank you. Our next question asks what the best method is for AV titration. Uh, yeah, right, right. Uh, so uh, when you when you're referring to titration, you're referring to uh, how to get the uh, amount of doses uh, produced in the in the uh, in the vials. Uh, the it's there's several fold uh, question there. So if if you're looking at uh, the ratio of the plasmids you're using, if you're looking at the uh, producer cell line, all all of those add to uh, what you're going to see uh, and concentrating at that last step to put in the in the vial. So it's a a multi uh, component uh, problem. Okay. Uh, we have another question that is on capsids. How do you quantify full capsids? Do you use AUC? Right, right. You know, so uh, at the moment, the guidance uh, is looking for uh, completed capsids. And traditionally, there's a battery of antibodies that can be used by our groups to look at uh, particular stages of capsid formation, including the uh, final uh, production of caps, the the final assembly step, and how many are complete capsid versus uh, how many are not uh, complete. Okay. Our next question is asking about well, it's an immunology question more generally um, about the number of leukocytes uh, that would give the best chance for people to be able to fight, in this case, uh, the question is related to COVID. Um, is it possible that the level of leukocytes could be a marker that would show uh, an ability to uh, fend off infection? Uh, that's uh, more an Im Im immunology question. I think if we you know, if you look at uh, the issues with AAV production, uh, you, you're trying to find, I mean, one of the reasons AAV is so interesting is it's got low immunogen immunogenicity. Uh, and, but are people working on uh, trying to reduce that? They are. Uh, and yes, uh, part of that screening would involve looking at the level of leukocytes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. A quick reminder to our live audience, you do still have time to ask a question. To do so, please type your question in where it says type your questions here and then press submit. Moving on then, um, our next question asks if you make AAV vectors for the baculovirus or insect host cell platform. Right, right. Uh, yeah, so we, we have groups that are doing baculovirus, although we're not doing AAV production in those uh, at the moment. Uh, so we're, we're trying to optimize HEC-293 cells because of their human origin. Uh, but there are, uh, there are groups that are trying to expand that operation in baculovirus. Uh, that's something we do have to talk to our baculo group about. Uh, but that's, that's a very interesting question. Is it easier to produce uh, AAV in that setting? It, it might, uh, you know, it, 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 although I think the advantages of having a human cell line might outweigh that, uh, but we would love to talk to groups that are interested in doing that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Our next question asks if there's a specific in vitro model that works better for AAV transfection and what might be the best assays to confirm that? I, I'm, I'm sorry, that, uh, I, that you broke up on me there, Sarah. Okay, no problem. Our next question asks if there's a specific in vitro model that works better for AAV transfection, and if so, what the best assays are to confirm that? Ah, yes. Uh, so th th there's a big, in this preclinical stage, there's a jump. So you have to go from your research groups, which might be in the thousands of samples, to uh, reducing that to hundreds of samples at the preclinical stage, even with a, a hundred or so samples, you're talking about uh, 20 mice per dose. So th the scale up is, is astronomical. And when you do that, you really want to have an in vivo test 
that is a model for your system. Yes, your your animal model is is probably very important, and there are ways to back that up with in vitro assays. So our groups are broken down. We have groups that are working on cellular assays. We have uh, we. We usually have the, our mice operations are in uh, Nanjing, uh, so we would have to work with you to figure out what your your animal model is. We might outsource some of that too. Okay, I'm not sure if you heard me correctly because actually the question was asking if if there was a vitro model that works better. Oh, I see on the message there, uh, in vitro model that works. Ah. Uh, uh, for an in vitro setting, yes, there are there are cell lines that can be used for the in vitro uh, targeting. Uh, uh, if you take RP65 blindness, uh, there are cell lines that replicate that, and you can you can use those to an extent. It, you really have to get uh, clinical data at at the very end, human data. But on the on the cell line, the cell line is always the first step in figuring out what your targeting is. And will that targeting be the same when you get into the clinic? Uh, th that is, uh, remains to be seen. But yes, there's, there's in vitro models for several of these disease states, and that is uh, done before you move on after, uh, to preclinical and beyond. Okay, thank you for mm -hmm. clarifying mm -hmm. that. Um, our next question, uh, asks if you know, uh, it's, it's more about uh, vaccine RNA, uh, uh, vaccines and RNA. So it's asking if you know whether um, RNA, the RNA, sorry, the question's not very clear, whether the RNA vaccine vector, it can hybridize for gene expression, um, whether or not RNA could form uh, hairpins and in theory uh, could interact um, in only a few um, base cells, I guess that is, to make... Yep. Uh... <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I see the question. Uh, uh, so there's a, a lot of levels of control. When we were talking about using the, the leucine zippers for targeting. Uh, there's also the gene regulation of, 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 of these uh, measures too. Can you onboard those? Uh, the payloads are rather small. so. What we're, if you can fit it into the virus, that may be possible, but what's more likely going to happen is that there are gonna be combination therapies where you're bringing in the control, let's say uh, some kind of miRNA or siRNA uh, that would be controlling that gene expression. Uh, you might see some non-viral uh, routes, which we're trying to expand with our linear DNA uh, capability. Our GMP linear DNA is uh, uh, a fast growing arena. And will will that go beyond virus? I think it will. And those payloads will be a lot bigger. And so you can you can onboard uh, several kinds of uh, controlling RNAs, anti antisense RNAs in there uh, for that for that uh, uh, delivery of the payload, and then control of that gene expression. Good question. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question asks if you can provide some further information about non-adherent cells. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very important question. So to get to uh, very large doses, uh, we have to move away from uh, adherent cells, which are done uh, in batch mode, and move to a more continuous operation where you can do the transfection in uh, possibly a, a tubular format, uh, certainly a robotic format, uh, but what that form or, or what that uh, would look like is you have to get uh, control over the cell growth and expansion. That's always going to be there, but it's the way you're going to transfect that cell. And if it's done in a, a more continuous macrofluidic setting, uh, that's where we are tending to go with our robots. And and that's and and also that's coupled with a lot of cell engineering. You have to uh, onboard some of the helper functions there. Uh, particularly uh, the way to increase the number of doses. And I think that's where this question is pointed toward. If you're trying to increase those number of doses with a continuous process, you also have to look at the level of cap that you're making uh, to meet up with the uh, amount of cells you're making. Okay, thank you very much. 
Our next question asks about the AAV helper free systems and whether or not that has a similar efficiency compared with traditional three plasmid production method. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So there, there, there's it's kind of a two part question, which is how much helper function do you put in the cell line and what does that do to the growth uh, of that cell and the complexity of, let's say, pi, if you're continuing to do pi uh, for your transfection route. Uh, does it get simpler with less plasmids? The, I, I think uh, if it's a plasmid setting, not a linear setting, they're going to be different. So this, you're going to optimize it e either for one or one or two plasmids having moved some of the helper function into the cell, or it's going to be combinations of plasmid and linear DNA, or it may, may just, I mean, ideally, you could see this being just linear DNA, but each one of those has to be optimized because of the different uh, DNA being used. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question asks about AAV serotype. Are production processes affected by the AAV serotype being used um, given different AAV tropism to the HEC 293 cell line? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I, I think you, you wanna have in-process analytics on this. Uh, we do a lot of the an analysis uh, post-production. And what needs to happen on these robotic systems, what we're striving to do is put the in-process analytics on in real time on the robot. Is it going to help with machine learning? Yes. Can that machine learning identify the empty capsids? I think that's coming along. And I know that sounds more mechanical, uh, but I think if you're going to, we have to have some kind of control over that chromatography step. And the paper, you know, that we talked about is moving the virus into the medium. I think that's a very important step, but you have to couple that with robotic system, which, which are going to do two things. It's going to uh, standardize the process, make it the timings better, uh, make it more efficient using the equipment. But you've got this equipment that now needs, it's blind unless you have the right analytical tools on that. Uh, so I see a combination of those working together. And is there a way to process out the empty caps? I, I think I think the answer to that is yes. Do we do it yet? Not really efficiently. It's most post, we look at most of the production after the fact, and we have to start looking at that at that during the process. Okay, thank you very much, because that was indeed the next question. How do you eliminate these empty and or partially filled uh, capsids? Um, yeah, it, it, you know, it's, it, it comes down to the equipment on that one, I think. I think it's going to be an equipment. Uh, uh, if we have the right equipment, we might be able to fractionate that uh, much better than we, than we do right now. Okay, thank you. Moving on then, if you were engineering an advanced next generation helper cell line, what do you think are the main considerations for regulatory agencies? Right, right. Uh, so what we're doing at GenScript is we're trying to uh, put these functions into the cell line and optimize them. Right now, we've got a lot of helper plasmids that haven't been really optimized. They haven't actually been changed from uh, the promoters that occur in the virus. And what needs to be done is we need to hyper-optimize the uh, level of cap and rep on the AAV helper side and on the ADD5 helper side. Oh, we, we haven't really explored a lot of what it would do if we changed the levels of those genes. So we're, we're looking at that. That's more on our DNA assembly, uh, and we couple that with our viral production group. Uh, at, at the same time you're doing this, you want to be generating data that would be good for our master file so that when we do work for you, uh, we can provide that CMC section for your master file. Great. Thank you very much. How would you suggest screening through the CAP and REP genes to improve replication success, enhancing AAV targeting and better VP1, 2, 3 assembly with positive strand DNA? Right. That that's a, 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 a multi multi part question, but it is highlighting what we are presently doing. So we have large uh, libraries of caps. Uh, the issue is not that we can't make them. 
uh, there's twofold. So there's a lot of groups that have already made them and they need to have the plasmids produced. That's why we're looking into uh, um, ultra high throughput plasmid production. Um, so you, you, you need to do thousands of plasmids a day and you need to do them at a scale where you can actually produce virus from the from those plasmid preps. So one is we want to scale up your plasmids to look through libraries of cap and rep. Uh, if you're going to be targeting with caps, you have to look through a lot of variants. If we do the leucine zipper versions like the Velcro AAVs, we have to put the uh, leucine zipper, the, the one half into the VP2. So we have to do large libraries of those. On the rep side, if we want to increase replication, looking at different binding to maybe synthetic ITRs, uh, that's very important. So there's the same theme is, is happening in both those camps. You have to look through large numbers of plasmids and we're gearing, we're trying to gear that up for this August. Um, as far as the success of, of the resulting caps, we need to marry those plasmids with the virus production in high throughput. And we're looking at ways to do the virus in very high throughput so that we can identify. Once we've done the plasmids, we're going to walk right into the uh, viral production. And then finally, it's as good as your, your assay. So what we're doing is we're trying to put robotic features on these assembly lines that allow us to look for complete capsid, empty capsid. You know, we had a lot of good questions today, and it, it, a lot of these questions are answered by better purification and better analytics. So we're trying to put both of those on our assembly lines. Thank you very much. And that is where we are going to finish for today. Dr. Stephen Hughes, thank you very much for your presentation and for answering our questions today. Thanks thank also you. to GenScript, our webcast sponsor, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com forward slash webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon. Thank you.